Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers and I'll serve as your host today. You can also see on the screen uh, our presenter for the day, Steve Sweeney, who I'll introduce uh, momentarily. Just a few points of logistics uh, before we get started. Today's presentation is being recorded. Uh, so look for an email shortly after the session ends with a link to view the recording. And please do share this with others in your organization. Uh, we will be fielding questions uh, throughout our time today. So if you have questions, just submit those in the Q&A box, uh, which is part of the Zoom toolbar. Um, we will do one of two things. We will ask questions as they come in. Uh, Steve has given us permission to do that. Um, and if there's any that come in afterwards, we'll field questions after the fact as well. So let me inter introduce uh, Steve. Uh, Steve and Sweeney uh, started working at Toyota Motor Manufacturing in Kentucky in 1987 and over the next few years worked in several areas of the organization, developed the initial office lean and maintenance lean systems, started the suggestion system, supported plants across North America by providing uh, TPS training and coaching. So to say that Steve is fully immersed in the Toyota production system would uh, surely be an understatement. So Steve, it is, it is really an honor to have you uh, with us here today, and I'll just go ahead and turn things over to you. Alrighty, thank you, Dwayne. And I do look forward to feedback. Uh, as you can see on the screen right now, uh, my email is steve at the letter C, the number four, the letter E and D, Edward and Delta dot US. And I'm also on LinkedIn if you want to connect there as well. Now, the next slide is really a reminder for me. Normally, I would do introductions uh, with the group. Uh, and uh, uh, then at the end, I would do a feedback with pluses and minuses, or what we often say, pluses and deltas. Uh, but uh, obviously with the group size that we're dealing with, that's not practical, but I would ask that if you do have any feedback at all, please, please submit it either through the chat function or uh, a subsequent to this, you can even send it to me in an email and I would appreciate that. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at the benefits of a common problem solving process. We're gonna look at an overview of PDCA and how it applies to the A3, which is the Toyota eight-step process. And we'll actually talk a little bit about the eight Ds and Six Sigma in a table. Uh, so you can see how the different problem solving processes align. Uh, practically all problem solving processes utilize the PDCA process. Okay, and then uh, we're going to get a little better understanding of PDCA, the foundations of it, and, and what parts it plays in the A3 elements, and then applying PDCA and A3 thinking on the job is the ultimate uh, win for all of us. Uh, whenever we do a class, one of the things we try to do is establish a project that's work-related even before we get there and we provide some homework and we utilize that throughout the class. And so that really helps to uh, make the learning a little bit more cohesive. Uh, everyone's kind of on board with uh, their problem so they have a little better time applying those principles to it. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, for the, this, I'm gonna leave this slide up here for the benefits of common problem solving process. It, it really is beneficial to the company overall to have a common process. I've worked with many companies over the years. Uh, Caterpillar uses Six Sigma, and we didn't try and change that. It, it, you know, most of the problem solving processes are good and solid. Uh, you can enhance them a little bit using some of the eight step tools or uh, pieces, but uh, they're all fine. Uh, there's benefits to all of them, but having the same across the organization accelerates the review and approval process of individuals making a proposal or wanting to make a change or get some uh, allocation of funding for a project. If you use the same problem solving process throughout the organization, it is amazing how it helps to streamline the process. So I wanted to make that up front. Uh, the next is the table on 
the uh, how the different alignment, how the different uh, problem solvings align. And of course, PDCA is Plan, Do, Check, Act. And as we look at DMAIC, uh, it would be define, measure, analyze, improve, control. Uh, you can see there's define, measure, and analyze is in the planning phase. Uh, improve is the do, the implementation of countermeasures, and then the control is the check and act. Uh, with the eight-step problem-solving process, we have it uh, set up in eight distinct steps. The first five are in the planning stage. Uh, if you were to look at the Toyota problem solving process back in mid to late 80s, you would have seen a six step problem solving process. And uh, they expanded it to the eight step problem solving process in 2000. And the reason we did that was to help people develop more discipline to spend time in the planning space. Uh, every culture is a little bit different. We're going to see a slide a little bit later that shows how problem solving and application or implementation of countermeasures is done in Japan and what percentage of those are spent on those two things and then in the U.S. So you'll be able to see a, a drastic change there. But for the plan phase in the eight step, we have clarify the problem, break down the problem, set targets analyze the root cause and develop countermeasures uh, and i'll use cm frequently because it's such a long word uh, also uh, we move to the the second step of pdca of do and that's where we're actually implementing our countermeasures and then check is going to be where we evaluate the results and uh, if we find that we attain our target uh, we're going to find what worked and, sta and standardize all of that. That's part of the ACT phase. If we find that we made part of our targets or not high enough level on our targets, we may, may re-churn the process and go back through and dig deeper in the first five steps again because we may have missed something. And as we go further in this eight-step process, you gain a better understanding of the problem and you do get more intelligent as it relates to the problem. So it's a very good possibility that you'll uncover some things that you may not have otherwise uh, seen when it was the first time you actually did something. Okay, uh, now when you compare it with the eight Ds, which is used at Ford Motor Company, uh, we have uh, create the team, and by the way, the eight Ds doesn't stand for the first letter of each of the words in the eight spaces. It's really the eight disciplines. And it's create the team and describe the problem, define containment actions, analyze root cause, define possible uh, corrective actions, which is the CA term that they use. And uh, that would be do the plan. And then do is implement the CAs. And then down to check is uh, define actions to avoid recurrence and congratulate team. So I think just by looking at the uh, Six Sigma and the eight Ds, I see that there's some benefit to maybe utilizing some of these components and add them to that problem solving process if you use that one. Uh, we did that at Caterpillar and uh, even though part of their control was to standardize, they liked that it spelled out as part of the standard, as, as part of the control step. So it made it a little bit more defined. We like to try and make this as easy as possible because the eight step, I think, simplifies it. So you could have everyone from engineers, high level leaders, uh, people that just enter the company at the entry level, all of them use the same problem solving process and it's simplified. Um, the, you know, it's just, to me, was, to me, it's the best one. I like it best. I've worked with TRIS, uh, which is a Russian problem solving. I've worked with some other uh, systems and different organizations uh, internationally, uh, but they all boil down to PDCA. And some people just use PDCA uh, and they have components within the PDCA similar to the eight step. So as we look at the learning outcomes, at the end of the webinar, I'd like you to have a better understanding of the PDCA cycle. Many of you already do. This is going to be a very quick overview of that. Uh, you know as well as I do that in an hour or 45 minute 
webinar, there's no way you're going to be able to cover all the stuff you need to cover. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I just wanted to uh, do what we can uh, to get you more familiar with it, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, typically, the introduction to PDCA and the Toyota eight-step problem solving is no less than a 16-hour class. And so you can see we're, we're going to just be scratching the surface. Thanks, Steve. Yes. A couple, couple questions have come in. Uh, uh -huh. Is root cause and countermeasures analogous to a hypothesis and experiments? Uh, it's, it's hypothesis, typically. Uh, and uh, many people, you can equate this to the Toyota Kata process, which is where you look at all the possible things that you could do and you pick one and you feel that that one's going to move you closer to your target area. And, and so that's a trial. That would be like one of your trials if you were doing it that way. Okay, so this other question, I'm not 100% sure I understand this, but I'll go ahead and put it out and see if it makes sense. Uh, where and when do users of the process fit? And then they put in parentheses frontline and clients. Oh, dot, okay. Dot. Yeah. Uh, with, uh, with the culture at Toyota, everyone within the organization, including the highest level leadership, which is the board in Japan, utilize the eight step problem solving process. Well, when we went from six steps to eight steps, uh, some folks said, well, you know, they put them side by side and they said, well, the sixth step is almost the same as the eight step. You have the same components there. And, and we really did, but we found that by breaking it into five distinct steps in the planning phase, it helps people spend a little bit more time in that phase. And that's the area where you can benefit the most gain is in the planning phase. And we're gonna, we'll probably talk about that a little bit more, but again, in this short time, we don't have a great deal. So everyone from entry level to the Toyota family members use the eight step problem solving process. So you've already uh, spurred a number of questions. Um, <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> Is there a way to know whether components to the training are missed? Uh, evaluation of the effectiveness of training? Yes, there, there is. Uh, when, when we made the change from six to eight steps at Toyota, even though they were almost the same with the breaking out of the two places where they were joined in planning, uh, it took Toyota over three years to roll that out from Japan to the manager level. And it took about an additional two years before it was rolled out to team member level. So you're, you're looking at a very gradual change. And I think that's something that we all should appreciate because we know that people resist change. But if we do it in slow incremental steps, it's embraced and it's more effective. Uh, during that implementation of the eight step, we had leadership in uh, the U.S., so the presidents of the U.S. plants, we had 15 presidents at the time that I was working with, and they needed to make a presentation to a uh, council in Japan that was made up of the board of directors. And they had to pass that board before they were certified as an eight-step problem solver. And so that went from the presidents being certified and then the presidents in the U.S. had a panel and the vice presidents in the U.S. presented to them. So using that methodology helped to ensure that people were following the first five steps, which again is the most important component of the eight step. And, and it's 80%, 85% of the work is accomplished in those five steps. And if you've gone that far with the problem, you're most likely going to go ahead and implement it. So there was not a worry about people not following through with that. And then one final question, and then I'll uh, turn you loose to, uh, to continue <laughs> on. Uh, David asks, on the A3-8 step, wouldn't RCA need to come before setting the target? Okay, many people don't like the target in the third step, to be honest with you, okay? And uh, what we're trying to do with that as being the third step is we're trying to get people to take a very deep, view of what they're doing in boxes one and two from their experience and their knowledge and things. We don't want them to just 
glance over it. And when they establish that step three target, it's basically the same as step seven, because whatever you establish in three, that's what you're going to report out on in step seven. And as you go through the problem, you might be in step five and identifying your countermeasures and all of a sudden say, wait a minute, uh, we really need to look back at that target again. It's okay to go back and adjust the target. So uh, that's one thing that is very flexible. And, and we used to joke about the A3. Uh, we used to say that you would go through uh, what we call a Nimi Washi process. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and we often said you would change your original A3 a hundred times before it was approved. And the interesting thing is, as you get closer to the end of that approval process, you start taking pieces from the earlier versions. So we tell people not to get rid of any of their earlier versions of the eight step until they get through with the final approved one because they may have some information there that would benefit. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. All righty, and so we're also going to look at how PDCA thinking uh, differs from traditional thinking and, uh, and this is just going to be some quick slides with uh, the way many people look at problem solving in our culture and how it would be done under the PDCA process and how we can apply PDCA thinking in A3 to our work and why we need to tell the PDCA story, okay? And so this is all something that's going to help us be a little bit more effective. Uh, so the first thing I just wanted to do a quick review of the PDCA cycle, plan, do, check, act, and uh, realizing that the PDCA is not a circle. Uh, imagine it more like a slinky, and it's a, it, it's, a, it's a coil, and as you're going down this coil, you're doing PDCA, PDCA, and within each of those phases of PDCA, you're going to do PDCA loops on the outside of it. So that's what we're trying to represent with these little blue areas, okay? So it's, it's a lot deeper than many people think. Uh, some people think that PDCA is very superficial, so they, they go to some of the other problem-solving processes, but really PDCA is foundational. So when we look at PDCA, it was originally introduced in the 50s to the Japanese by Deming, and it was originally based on Schuert's PDSA cycle, and as you know, Sheward and Deming were from two different academic uh, universities, so uh, they don't like to use each other's models. Uh, so uh, the PDSA is Plan, Do, Study, Act, and uh, the, Deming, the Deming's model is Plan, Do, Check, Act. But every time he covered that, he said, check doesn't mean you check the box. Like that's what many of us think about when we say check. Uh, it really means that you study the process. So he really supported that study, but the PDCA is most common today. Originally used to integrate communication between research, design, manufacturing, and sales. I find that interesting. Uh, it was a later adopted uh, to the present form of PDCA uh, by Deming and, and again proliferated uh, once it hit Japan. Uh, we all know that if you talked about uh, quality, in uh, Japanese products, uh, pre-50s, uh, they were junk, and they would break the first time you use them. And so uh, after Deming got in and did a lot of quality and used the PDCA cycle with them, now when we talk about technology coming from Japan, it's reliable, it's solid. I mean, we look at cameras and watches and a lot of other things that they produce there, and it's all very solid products. And we have learned from them as all of the North American car manufacturers have, uh, they ch the Japanese challenged us uh, to improve our quality. And uh, that's why we're where we are today in the US automotive market. And this applies beyond automotive, by the way. This, I, I've worked with uh, banks and even the Federal Reserve System in Detroit, uh, hospitals, uh, Lean and uh, problem solving applies across the board, even work with churches and nonprofits. Uh, so when we talk about using PDCA, we're trying to identify key questions that you should ask, uh, show how to work more effectively and efficiently, uh, provide a process that will clearly define the steps, 
And this helps people to stay on target. It's kind of like saying, uh, I want you to drive to uh, Orlando, Florida and go to Disney World. And, and that's all your instructions. I mean, you, you wouldn't know necessarily where to go, how to get there most efficiently. Maybe you drive, maybe you fly. But if I give you a map and you're driving and I show you your route, you're going to be able to accomplish that more likely than if you just randomly try and take roads every which way. So it's a map. It really does help. Uh, it supports teamwork through clear communications, and that's where we get into the Nemawashi. Uh, it helps to integrate functions, and as we saw earlier, the design, manufacturing, sales, aftermarket, everything. Uh, it, it supports all of that. Uh, here's in the planning phase, here's the traditional, uh, usually focuses on immediate need, generally reactive. We're putting out fires all the time. We're shooting from the hip. Majority rules, plan another approach without reviewing. I mean, this happens time and time again. In PDCA, we're looking at a lengthy planning an, uh, analysis, but it, lengthy does not necessarily mean it's gonna take you weeks, months, or years to do it. It's based on the problem you're dealing with. So some problems you may be able to do in a week, some problems might take you a quarter, some problems might take you multiple years. Uh, I know when we were doing Six Sigma projects, we had 15 weeks to go through the DMAIC process. Everything had a defined space. And although that's good to be regimented, it forces you to get some work done. Uh, it's, it's a little bit too uh, academic for many people that you would have walking into entry level jobs to utilize the Six Sigma process on the floor. Uh, the Caterpillar had been using it for nine years before I got there and I could talk to anyone on the floor and they would know what the, the different phases of discovery and how long you would be in that phase and everything and that was floor level but it took them nine years to get there. Uh, so it's a uh, PDCA is proactive response to long-term goals. It utilizes a scientific approach again similar to Toyota Kata. Uh, requires consensus and it really has a uh, sufficient review before countermeasures are implemented uh, or considered. Under the do phase, uh, so many times, uh, we see traditionally we minimal, uh, minimal emphasis on training and education, uh, heavy emphasis on doing, we're gonna wing it, we're gonna figure it out as we go, and the Band-Aid approach. Let's stick something on this and, and just get it going. Uh, there is a place for uh, something to reduce the problem while you're coming up with a long-term countermeasure. Unfortunately, many organizations, once they put that Band-Aid on, if it works well enough, they may not visit it again because they're fighting another fire somewhere else. Uh, under PDCA, we follow through on preparation activities, including the orientation and training of individuals impacted. And we use pilot activities before going full-blown implementation. Okay, and uh, this is the slide on the cultural differences between Japanese and Americans. Uh, I had this for several cultures because I deal with different cultures and it is different in many organizations across the world. Uh, in Japan, they spend 70% of their time planning and 30% executing. In the United States, we spend 30% on planning and 70% executing. To show how valuable that planning phase is, the Georgetown facility, uh, the original facility was an $800 million investment. And that plant started up two weeks ahead of schedule. I was working on a plant that was an $80 million project before I joined Toyota and we were not even a full year into the project and we were three months behind our delivery date because of weather, uh, labor disputes, material delivery, and that's because we only spent 30% of our time in planning. I wasn't doing all the planning. I had an architectural engineer, I had a manufacturing and a mechanical and a paint booth and everything, engineers all involved with doing that plan. So we were all doing the 30%. And again, that was just before I joined Toyota. So Steve, another question. Um, is yeah. there an effective way to understand the length of a PDCA cycle? And then they put a comment in here, knowing that some companies have scheduled training classes for PDCA separately. 
Yeah. Um, as far as having a, a you know, a, a specific time frame, I don't believe you can put a specific time frame to the application of PDCA. Uh, however, in the training component of it, as I mentioned, uh, the introduction to PDCA is an eight hour class and the introduction to the A3 is an eight hour class. But we have some additional classes that go beyond that. Most of the time, once we've completed the classes, we would become a taskmaster uh, in some respect and help individuals work through their eight step problem solving process on the problems they're dealing with in their plant. And that's where you develop the discipline to do the work. And as you get more and more experience, um, folks that have been using PDCA and the A3 system for years can look at something and say, this will probably take us about a month to do. This will probably take us a quarter to do uh, because they know from their experience. But you, it takes time to get there, but you benefit from the application of it immediately. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, and then traditional for the check phase, uh, typically there's hesitancy to discuss problems. We know many times in organizations, uh, the problems are seen by people that work on the floor uh, and even uh, floor supervisors, maybe even mid-level managers, but they hesitate to bring problems forward because they sometimes feel like they're persecuted because of that problem, even though they were identifying the problem that we need to focus on and, and fix. Uh, so there's uh, another thing would be the fear among employees to reveal early warning indications. And when we did our, our maintenance uh, lean training at Toyota, we talked about things like, you know, what are the aromas you smell when you go to a breakdown? Because if you had a transformer burnout, it has a different smell than a capacitor burning out would have. And so we would train them to do more than just the superficial look and run away and say, this is what we need to do. Uh, so there's a power to that. PDCA, specific input and outputs uh, are identified and measure for success is identified early on. And as we get into the Nimi Washi discussion, you'll see more how this comes into play. And then problems are identified immediately. People don't feel uncomfortable with saying, hey, this is a problem. They know that they're not going to get blamed for the problem, uh, but they're going to help to be part of the solution. And then uh, lean philosophy, encourage full communication without fear of reprisal. Very important. We have to be open. Uh, and of course, lean principles and philosophies are the most powerful thing I've seen in all the different organizations I've worked in. And as I said, everything from major manufacturers like Caterpillar that's looking at, uh, uh, I don't know for sure what they're running at now, but when I was working with them, it was $46 billion was their net revenues one year. And uh, we impacted that by... 26% by applying lean in our projects in the plant. So we improved their net earnings significantly. I had a smaller company I worked with that in the course of three years, they improved their net revenues by 419%. Uh, and what, what company, especially small companies, can't use that extra percentage. So you wanna do more with less and avoid the waste. Problems should be considered opportunities uh, for improvement, not seen as problems to point the finger and place blame. And then of course the responsibility is on everyone to bring problems forward and also to help provide solutions to those problems. And then finally the act step, traditionally focus on bottom line, uh, you know, what's the profit? Push the numbers out the door, uh, frequent use of band-aids, tendency to spin wheels rather than solve root cause problems, jump to the first solution without proper root cause analysis. All of these things cost us more money and time over the uh, repair time than uh, anything else does. But in PDCA, we look to standardization. We look at temporary countermeasures, but there are always followed up with permanent countermeasures, and emphasis is on education and training, 
We want to develop the individuals because if I have two people trying to solve a problem and I have 2,000 people trying to solve a problem, I'm going to be able to solve the problem either way, but which one's going to be more effective and more powerful of a countermeasure? Obviously, the one with more brain. So we always talk about collaborative problem solving. Steve, how do you, uh, David asks here, how do you extract valuable feedback on problems uh, from more general noise and, and maybe just gripes? Uh, yeah, you know, that is a cultural thing. And, you know, uh, quite honestly, if someone comes to me uh, with a gripe or a problem per se, I would say, okay, I need you to help me identify what are some of the potential causes and countermeasures. And so w what I'd like to do is set up a meeting with you later on today uh, in the next few days, because I'm busy, whatever. And I'd like you to follow this outline and provide them with a PDCA outline of the planning phase just to have them actually think about the problem instead of just letting that monkey on your back. Because, you know, ultimately the people that do the work every day are the ones that see the problems the quickest and can fix the problems the quickest in most instances. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I usually do an exercise. I'm only including this in here to give you an idea of how you would do it. But in a classroom, a lot of times we'll introduce the PDCA process. Some people are familiar with it. Some people have heard of it, but have no clue what it is. Uh, but basically we say do something. And, and what we do first is something that's not work related, unless it's like going to work or, you know, planning a, a you know, a, a party at work or something like that. Uh, we want it to be a lighter exercise. And then we just have them list all of the activities that are required for that event from beginning to end, and then relate what steps of the PDCA cycle they actually fall into. And that kind of helps them to start looking at things. And because it's a, a non-threatening type exercise, it's not work related, it's usually a little bit more casual. So uh, I had one company I was working with that there were three ways into the plant and all three ways had train tracks across them. And if people did not properly plan to get to work uh, early enough, they could hit a train there and be late for work. And as we know, in a lean organization, if everybody's not online on time, you, you can't start. So uh, that was one of the things we put up there uh, to help them. And then uh, it's just an easy and a quick uh, exercise that you can do in any problem solving class. Okay, so uh, we then would debrief and talk, have each of the teams because we would, like if I have a class of uh, 15 or 20 people, we'd break it up into three or four teams and then I'd have each team report out and uh, we, re we change the responsibility of who's actually being the gatekeeper at that table and the facilitator around so everybody gets a chance to do that when they do these exercises. and. Uh, so they, they uh, would report out on, well, the, this is what we were going to do. These are the things in the plan phase, do check and act. And the whole time, the rest of the class can ask questions or, or bring up issues. And that helps people to understand a little bit more about what the, uh, you know, components are. And sometimes you'll have people say, well, that, that's kind of in the do and the check phase or something like that. Or it's actually in more than uh, two phase. You know, it's okay. It's okay, we want them to start thinking out of the box, so that's all right. So we saw this model before, but we've added the center of it called grasping the situation or grasp the situation. Many times we abbreviate it, capital G, lowercase t, capital S. And so GTS is a significant component of the plan, do, check, act cycle and the A3 process. And so what exactly is it? Uh, what we're looking at is, uh, you know, how is this important? Well, the first thing is it's going to help us to define the impact. You know, what I'm planning to do, the event idea or whatever that I'm wanting to do and what changes I want to make and helps me to understand the impact and go beyond just my immediate area, uh, but it helps me to uh, spend time in looking at not just my area, but how other areas may be impacted. So the grasp the situation 
uh, is part of the Nimawashi model. Now, an interesting thing is, and I've worked at several Japanese companies. Uh, uh, I went to probably a half a dozen, and uh, Toyota was the only one that used the term Nimawashi. And, uh, but some of the other companies I worked with, they had terms that Toyota didn't use. And so, you know, there's no magic to this. Uh, it really is part of uh, being a disciplined organization and following the procedures. Once you understand the purpose of Nimawashi, people are on board with it, but they never heard the term. But it was very commonly thrown about at Toyota. At, at Toyota, Nimawashi was probably as common as Kaizen or Andon. And those are two, two words in Lean that are used uh, with every organization doing Lean. Okay, uh, so basically we're looking at Nimawashi as where we get information, we give information, but you notice there's communications both by the uh, problem solvers and the customers or the other areas impacted by it. So a little better illustration would be looking at a group, and these are all from different sections, departments, uh, maybe uh, within the same team, but they do different work in the team. And uh, so really, Nimawashi is something where you're going to look to gain clarification, support, consensus, and a clear action. Okay? So uh, Chase asks if this might be equivalent to uh, getting the voice of the customer. Yes, it is. It is very much so. Uh, we believe that it's more uh, appropriate to consider not just the customer, but also other areas that are impacted. So we talk about stakeholders when we do Nimawashi and anyone that could be impacted by this change, uh, whether directly or indirectly, they need to be part of the Nimawashi process. Now, when I explain it a little bit more, you're gonna say that seems very inefficient, uh, but in the long term, it, it's part of that spend a little bit more time in the planning and then the execution is very fast. And that's basically the benefit of Nimawashi. So where did Nimawashi originate? Well, really Nimawashi is an agricultural term, uh, which is interesting. And if you were going to transplant a very large tree, uh, you know, it's first of all, it's very expensive. Uh, besides getting the equipment and everything set up to move that tree. But the likelihood of that tree surviving is even more critical then because it is so expensive to do. And so Nimawashi was when you would take dirt from the new location and put it where the old tree is and then take some dirt from where the old tree is and put it where the new tree location is going to be. And you do that several times. And over time, you're conditioning the tree to get comfortable with that new soil. Because most times when you transplant something, especially large plants, uh, they don't survive because they're not a, a, you know, acclimated to that soil or that area. So that's, that's the whole thing with Nimawashi from a practical standpoint. But when we look at grasping the situation from a problem solving process, the higher the cost associated with the project and or the higher the risk of the project being successful, the more focus and emphasis we need to put on grasping the situation. Uh, this again is going to help to resolve a lot of problems over the time of the implementation. All right, so grasping the situation, some of the key factors would be big picture, broad perspective, problem consciousness, current conditions, what's happening, desired conditions, what should be happening, and continual process where we're active, not passive, and then of course, Nimawashi. When we Nimawashi a problem, we said we had eight steps. When we complete step one with our working committee, we would present that to every stakeholder that we identified and get their input and approval before we move to the next step. And we would meet on with them one-on-one. -on -one. We would not bring them in mass. Like I was working with a hospital where they had about 37 people associated with this one process improvement we were doing and our working committee was five people. It wasn't practical to have those 37 doctors, nurses, uh, technicians, everything associated with it 
while we're doing the work, but we needed to include them in, in every step that we made. Uh, but we met with them one-on-one. -on -one. We would not meet with them in mass. And the reason we didn't was whoever was most senior in the room, everyone else in the room would wait to see what they would say before they spoke up in most instances when you do a group uh, discussion. So we met with them one-on-one. -on -one. It is a little bit more time consuming, but again, the intent is to spend more time in that planning phase and that's part of it. Okay, so an element of good plan would include the who, what, when, where, and how, and of course, measurements. And we do also talk about SMART goals. This is something that's just kind of an automatic thing for us. So we don't want to uh, forget any of those fundamental components that makes it more effective. Uh, if you're looking at um, the process and results measures, we're interested in both. Many organizations are only looking at the management by objectives. Did I hit my target? Did I hit my goal? Uh, we have to remember that there's process measures that are very important. I'm not a sports person. If you ask me who's going to ring the, the bowl or the pennant or the cup or whatever, I'm going to ask you who's playing because I'm, I don't really know and I don't follow sports. I'm too busy <laughs> with things. But uh, I was told that this is an actual example. Process measure would be first downs, the score, pass completions, time remaining, and third down conversions. And then the results measurements would be things like the final score, the attendance, television ratings. You know how that goes today. So uh, that's just an example when we set our goals and targets. Telling the PDCA story or telling the A3 story, what we're looking to do is get commitment, agreement, buy-in and clear action. And by going through those eight steps, the first five especially, we get agreement from every stakeholder, we get their input, we may make adjustments to our A3 as a result of that input, but we're going to get these four things by going through that A3 with the Nemawashi process. And then, so where do we go from here? I usually suggest uh, seek uh, you know, assistance from experienced team members. Uh, I frequently get emails and even get calls sometimes from previous clients that say, hey, we ran into this. We never had this before. What can we do? That's all part of it because I believe my success is their success. And so I'm very interested in, in my clients being successful in what they do. Another is to seek input from the team. Do not try and be the problem solver. The manager does not have to have all the answers. Um, middle managers are the ones that are most difficult to convert sometimes, and those of you that are out there listening now, you would agree. Uh, you feel like you're losing control because you're becoming a facilitative leader instead of a directing leader. But a facilitator leader doesn't have to have all the answers. You have that collaborative intelligence from the entire team that's helping to solve the problems. And then we want to look at getting actively involved in the Nemawashi process and get feedback from others on what to do. And again, that's one of the reasons I ask for your feedback on the very front end of this, because everything that you can provide helps me to get a little bit better for my folks and my clients, okay? So summary key points, uh, just gonna spend a couple minutes on that. I mean, we're pretty close to at time now, but we wanted to do, look at the PDCA story has different parts to it. We wanna make certain that we're consistent with our communications. Um, that I think everybody could agree that communications is where so many things break down. And so Nemawashi can help build that up a little bit. We want to make certain that we tell the story and it should be in both written and verbal forms. When we do a, a Nemawashi, we go to the individual. We had already sent them a copy of the A3 form and the box that we're going to be reviewing and that gives them time to look at it and contemplate it. And then when we meet with them, their feedback is very quick. So it is a quick process, but you just have to follow the, the procedures. And then uh, the objective in telling the story is to get that commitment, agreement, buy-in, and action. Okay, the eight steps of the eight-step problem-solving process are clarify the problem, break down the problem, target setting, root cause analysis and countermeasure development. That's all part of the planning phase. That leaves us three, and there's do, check, and act that follow up. So obviously, see countermeasures through is the do, 
The check is to confirm results and the standardize is to act. And then you go through that process again whenever necessary and you could return the same problem if you want to get better at it if that's your bottleneck or that's your data that you need to improve this is an example of a uh, a3 and and typically it would be done in excel and you could change the size of the boxes some problems require more in the breakdown the problem and the root cause analysis than it does in the confirmed results so the box sizes can change this is a graphical presentation of the uh, problem solving sheet that we use. And it's basically, I like the gap tool. When you clarify the problem, it's a great visual. Uh, there's many tools you can use and break down the problem. One of my favorite is the Pareto diagram. Uh, for setting targets, a lot of times we're gonna say, this is our problem level and uh, we need to make certain that we get to this level. That's our goal or our target for this project. Now for root cause analysis, some people argue the fishbone is not a root cause analysis tool. It is not in and of itself, but it's an easy tool to use. Oftentimes it's used in break down the problem area, which is a, it's a quick, easy tool to use. Uh, but if you add the five whys to the fishbone, it can help you to identify root cause, okay? And then developing countermeasures, uh, we have a, uh, force field analysis matrix here that helps you to determine which countermeasure or measures would be best. And then of course, when we do the C countermeasures through, we're looking to identify what's going to be done, you know, who's going to do it, and the, the communications that's going to happen. That's the report, inform, consult. And uh, this is all part of that Nemawashi process. And then finally, uh, well, not finally, I'm sorry, step number seven, we get to the confirming results. And again, this illustration by this time is the same as step three over here. Obviously, the data may be different. Like here, they did not accomplish the full target they wanted to, so they may want to return the problem. And then basically, you would have to redo your Pareto because you might have different things that have surfaced beyond others that were visible before. And then finally, the step eight is to standardize successful processes. So for you uh, getting started, this is just kind of a very, very brief overview. Uh, consider potential barriers and concerns based on your corporate culture. Negotiate around them to get the process started. Uh, once you start using the process, I think people will embrace it because they'll see over time as people get better at being structured problem solvers, they save more money, more time, have less safety problems, uh, and more net revenues. And then over time, uh, participants will realize the benefits from their personal side as well. And so uh, if we have any other questions and answers, I told Wayne that I'd be hanging around for a little bit longer. Yeah, so uh, I did get a couple more questions here. Um, a uh, one that Chase is asking here, are you grasping the situation before putting an employee through a training class for PDCA or DMAIC? For example, related to the suggestion system, should there be a Nemawashi process established on the suggestions coming in yeah there there really needs to be now toyota i actually was responsible for the toyota suggestion system when i was at georgetown and the last year i had responsibility for it we had in excess of a hundred thousand suggestions from 5800 team members and uh it was a 97 percent implementation rate and we had over uh 97% of the suggestions processed and paid in less than 45 days. It's, it's all on the culture though, because every company is different. Uh, so I think it's important that we include it in everything that we do, because that's when it becomes part of the normal business process, as opposed to just something I need to do because of class. And typically when we have classes, uh, we will not always do a pre and post training and that assessment, but understand that the best assessment of training is not necessarily the pre and post for knowledge. 
It's how you apply it and if you apply it in the workspace. And of course, that goes to the, I believe, fifth level of Kirkpatrick's uh, assessment where you're actually looking at people doing it. So part of our role is to do the training. And then I mentioned earlier about being the taskmaster. And I had one company I was going to two weeks a month. I would go one week and we would do training and have two uh, rapid process improvement teams working. And the next week I go back, I would check with them and all the other previous teams and see where they were with their projects and make sure that they're being prodded along until it becomes part of a habit. And so that's how we, we get that uh, indoctrinated into the organizations. Well, Steve, uh, we, we are a little bit past target time. Um, what's the old adage in uh, entertainment? Leave, leave them wanting more. <laughs> I, I, I kind of think we've done that. Uh, so uh, by, by all means, uh, reach out to Steve if you have additional questions. Uh, would like some follow-up training uh, of some sort along these lines, uh, feel free to reach out to me as well. Uh, you should have my email address at duane at leanfrontiers.com. So, Steve, thank you so much for not only sharing your insights today, but for uh, just immersing yourself in the Toyota production system and then being able to uh, communicate what that means to those of us that have not experienced it firsthand. Yeah, my as, yeah, as mentioned earlier, uh, you'll receive an email shortly with a link to the recording. Uh, and again, please do share this with others in your organization that may find this information useful. And I do encourage you to reach out to Steve or myself if you would like to go even deeper uh, into this, this topic. So, Steve, thanks again. And thanks uh, to everyone who participated in today's session. Have a great day.